This, this is the Our Auto Expert Podcast. Find us on air, online, on mobile, and on your smart speaker. Please subscribe at ourautoexpert.com. Our Auto Expert. 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 Now, here's the host of Our Auto Expert. Our Auto Expert. Nick Miles. Locally created, nationally celebrated from the southeast to the northwest. This is America's Car Radio Show. If it has a throttle, we'll feature it on air, online, on smart speaker, and on smartphone. This is our auto expert, where two million Americans get their automotive news daily. I'm your host, Nick Miles, along with Truck Girl Jen, who told me on the way in that the RAV4 and the event that she drove it in the snow changed her life. It did. So how did it change your life, Jen? It made me understand and realize weight distribution within the vehicle, especially on ice. You know, we get black ice here, here all the time, and it's really scary. But yeah. now you know. Now I you're do. in charge. You can handle it. Yes. Um, let's go on some ice and see how we do. Okay. She's in for it. Yeah. Uh, although you didn't like let's, the, you let's didn't, wait a few months. You didn't <laughs> like everybody that taught you that day. No. But no. But you liked some of them. I did. But you didn't like others. Right. They had attitude. Big time. Yeah. Yeah. What did they say to you? But it was, um, yeah. Oh, one guy I've said. I've never seen anybody drive like this. Yeah. Like? In 25 years of teaching, I've never seen anybody drive like this. And I was like, is that a good thing or a bad thing? He didn't respond. So whatever. <laughs> well, either you're a really, really, really amazing ice driver or you're horrible. There's well, only two choices. In that uh, yeah. And he didn't 25 respond. years of experience. And that's, tells us that was at the Bridgestone Winter Driving School. That was amazing. Uh, you had a good time. I did. Well. We're going to have huge amounts of flavor in this morning's show, Mm -hmm. or today's show, I should say. Uh, We are going to have an international flavor. We're going to be talking about a supercar which is actually affordable. Yes, you and I could probably afford one. I want one. Um, (laughs) I bet you we could fit in them, too. (laughs) uh, We're going to to talk to Roger uh, Ormisher. He is the VP of Communications at McLaren. He's going to tell us all about this car. Jerry Spawn joining us from Rolls-Royce. He is the head of North and South Americas, and we're going to talk about the Rolls-Royce's uh, first collection car, the Dawn Silver Bullet, uh, and inspired by the Dawn Sil- the, the Silver Dawn, I think, from the 1920s. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's kind of cool. Uh, Mike Cordell joining us. He's the other half of our auto expert. He's going to talk about his BMW riding school. It's, it's funny because Mike got a new Ducati motorcycle. And he went to this BMW riding school where they had lifts on the motorcycles. And they did off-roading. And now he wants to take his Ducati, Italian street racer, and put a <laughs> lift on it so he can off-road it. Can't wait to hear about this one. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure his wife was probably not too happy that he spent the money on a Ducati. And then... And then he's now he's going to lift it, which, you know, if you do anything to a motorcycle, you never get that money back, by the way, if you uh, modify it. Uh, Jen and I are going to talk about uh, a bunch of stuff today. Um, also, we're going to have somebody on, which I'm kind of excited about, to talk about the brand new 2020 Santa Fe all-wheel drive limited. Uh, by 2022, Hyundai say that they will have uh, rear seat reminders in most of their vehicles. So you can't leave something in the back seat without being told about it. Um, we're also going to talk to Russell Datz about the Volvo XC90. Uh, this vehicle continues to amaze everybody since it came out, I think, about five, six years ago now. It's still uh, top of the heap when it comes to the competition. Uh, we are very, very lucky to have the president of Jeep on the phone today, uh, Jim Morrison, joining us to talk about the new Gladiator Diesel. Uh, I'm going to ask him some difficult questions about that. And uh, Toyota North America has expanded its programs to help people learn to fix their Toyotas. Mm -hmm. Um, And we're going to find out all about that as well on today's show. So it's a pretty packed show. Uh, Anything you're specifically looking forward to, Jen? Uh, All of the above. Really? (laughs) Yeah, the first segment. That's because you booked the show, right? That's right. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, and I, obviously, I'm excited to talk about a supercar that I could finally own because that's my big deal. Exactly. Uh, so Roger's on the phone from McLaren. Uh, Roger, you know, first of all, I have to tell you the most exciting thing to me. I'm a big uh, uh, Lando Norris fan, and when uh, I saw him, I caught my it caught my eye a picture of him sitting in a race car that looked a little bit too small for him. 
uh, and then I, yes. I had to open the article, and uh, and then he uh, there there he is sitting in your new McLaren. It is. It is a little bit small for him. I agree. It's really aimed at three to six year olds, Nick. But uh, <laughs> he decided he wanted to take it for a little test drive in our headquarters uh, in Woking, England. So uh, I guess in an F1 drive, we had to let him do what he wanted to do. Yeah. No. Exactly. Uh, how did he do in it? By the way, he didn't roll it or spin it out or anything. No, it was all good, I think. It was, a, it was only a short test drive, but uh, I think he was quite happy to get back in his F1 car for this weekend in Belgium. I actually see, and, and you know, far be it from me to organise automotive events, but next time you have a ride and drive, I could just see you setting up a course with all the journalists in, in these and racing each other we around had, the track. We had done that, Nick, oh, nice. when we did the 600 LT, I think it was at Hungara Ring in... Um, um, about 18 months ago, we had uh, the 720S, which was the predecessor to this one, and we actually had Germans running them around a little course, and we couldn't get them out of them into the real car. It was kind of fun. <laughs> well, you know, give a journalist something that they can actually mess around in. They don't want to. They don't want to get out of it. So let's talk about this a little bit. So uh, it's a kid's car. It's a toy car. It's affordable. If you can't actually own a McLaren in your driveway and you still have to work a little bit more to have Rowan Atkinson money, you could actually uh, have one of these. Uh, and this is not the first one you've done, is it? No, it's the third. We had P1 originally, which was our first Ultimate Series car, and then there was a 720S version. And now it's been superseded by a McLaren Senna version. Yeah, and of course the Senna's, well, I don't know, do you call it the pinnacle of your uh, of your collection or not? The Senna one, probably, yeah. It's an Ultimate Series car, Nick, as you know. So the original road car was basically a road legal track car. It was the most um, sophisticated track car that we could build that was still legal for the road so uh, at a million dollars a shot this one is a little bit cheaper to buy yeah uh, i think the, the price i saw was just just over 580 dollars something like 582 or something like that yep yeah so 582 dollars gets you a mclaren how how much did you guys have on the input of this vehicle did you just give them drawings and say go at it or did you say no no it can't handle like that around corners <laughs> <laughs> there's only so much you can do with an electrified car right. obviously. but um, no I think there's a big input in terms of we're quite careful about the brand as, as most of uh, the supercar manufacturers are so we work very closely with them through it and you want to try and work in as much of the real car as you can in, in that kind of thing so as you know it's got the dihedral doors in it yep. open up and, and look very impressive uh, and then it's actually got the real engine sound as well we actually work the real engine sound of the centre into it so when you push oh. the button to start it up it actually sounds like the real car oh that's awesome oh. yeah and and so ultimately who do you think is going to be the customer for this i'm not saying <laughs> the user is probably pretty obvious it's going to be somebody three to six but who's the customer going to be i think those proud dads out there will be buying it for their sons won't they yeah. this this first encouragement of you could be lando norris in 15 years time get on with it yeah yes <laughs> You just have to make I, it a little bit bigger. For, well, yeah. or, 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 or we'd all have to lose a little weight. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, exactly. La- La- Lando's pretty, he's a pretty slight guy. He's only five foot seven, and he's a very, he's a very slim. Gen- you have to be a slim if you're a race yeah. driver. Unfortunately, when you sit in front of a computer all day and a, and a microphone or a television camera, you, you're you not as slim as you used to be. Um, the, now, these are all on, are all of them on sale, or is it now just the center that's on sale for these toy cars? You could, I think you still pack up 720s here and there. There is a few stuff you still have them, but I think they're on run out now. And it'll be Senna from here on in. So um, you can right. buy it from a McLaren retailer. That's the first place that will have it. Um, and there's uh, 25 of them in the US. So you can look on cars.mclaren.com yep. to find your nearest McLaren retailer. Uh, and hopefully, as, as we move closer to the Christmas season, when more people are thinking about this sort of thing, they'll actually be in selected Walmart and Target stores as well to order. Excellent. Uh, have you done any zero to 60 mile an hour tests in the toy? I haven't, unfortunately. I haven't got one over here yet. We haven't got our first press test car over oh. here yet, Nick. So I've, I've been unable to try it out. But it's the sort of thing you do in the dark of night so as not to embarrass yourself in front of the neighbours, obviously. <laughs> We're, wait a second. So uh, I have a question. When you send me the actual Senna to test drive, will there be a toy in the trunk? <laughs> Yeah, that's the end of You should know that. Oh, the yeah, I meant the front. It's a pure race car. There's, well, it's not even that on the center, unfortunately. We skipped everything out of it. So, sadly, we'll have to put it on the roof here. Yes, all right. I mean, whatever you need to do. I'm not sure I'd be very comfortable with a roof rack I'll on the top of my center. I'll reach you in a little one. Yes. <laughs> 
<laughs> uh, we, often we have radio station parties, and the last time we had a radio station party for the show, we had tricycles. So maybe mm-hmm. we'll be racing se- electric <laughs> centers up and down the driveway. That would be a, an awful lot of fun. Uh, is it going to be uh, center owners, or is it going to be McLaren owners that buy these for their kids, or do you think it's going to have a universal appeal? The 720 had universal appeal. Um, it was it was very interesting because I think we saw a lot of them sold to people that probably wouldn't have been in this, this area before because it looks so cool. And, and with the features it's got, it makes it a lot of fun for the kids. Um, so, I, yeah, there'll be some McLaren owners, but I think it's got widespread appeal beyond that. Um, yeah. I'm just going to expect to see some really inappropriate pictures of, you know, like dads with a beer in their hand driving one around the driveway because <laughs> this is the only chance. Is the, old, the old 20-year-old Ford Taurus isn't cutting it. They have to go and buy, <laughs> buy the electric centre. It, it, there, there's a million and one visions that go into my mind. I can't wait to actually my see. My new uh, commuter. Yes. <laughs> I, no, I think it might, cut, yeah. it might take a little with time. Your Nick. Yeah. yeah. It might take a little time to get to work, though. Uh, you know, in this, uh, do we know the top speed, or do we know any stats about it, or is just as fast as you go? It's probably weight dependent anyway. Those, those people that weigh, yeah. If you sit, if I sit in it, it'll go about two miles an hour. If a three-year-old sits in it, it'll probably go about fifteen miles an hour. I can push so, you. Yeah, that, that sort of thing. Yeah, right. Only, go on. Only about five or six miles an hour, I think. So, so I think. Uh, it's, it's a far way off the 201 miles an hour of the real car, but at least you, you're getting a taste of speed at the, the bottom end of the range. I'm telling you right now, I'm going to rechip it, see how fast I can get it to go. <laughs> that's, that's the stupid stuff I do. Yeah. But, but Nick, you'll be out of warranty then if you do that. So yeah, well, I'll just buy another one, won't I? <laughs> What's money? Can't take it with you, can you? Uh, Roger, thanks for spending some time with us on our Auto Expert. I really enjoy this, the new electric little centre toy car. Get it from your McLaren dealer, or you can find it later on at the, uh, probably in time for the holidays i'm going to guess at target and uh, walmart stores around 582 dollars is what i'm reading about this it's uh, a nice piece of machinery don't forget you can watch all of our tv and uh, listen to our podcast and also read all of our social media posts at our auto expert stand by rolls royce coming up you're listening to our auto expert catch up with previous episodes of the show at our auto expert the website it's uh, where you can hear past shows see automotive videos and read insider car stories about your next ride our auto expert is where two million americans get their automotive news daily you'll find it all at our autoexpert.com if you were to go into a rolls royce dealer or to rolls royce's uh, the world of Rolls Royce, as I like to call it in England, uh, you ordered your car. The likelihood of you having uh, the car the same as anybody else is pretty much close to impossible. I mean, it's not absolutely impossible because you could design it around somebody else's car. But because of the bespoke program, you can get your car exactly the way you want it. And nobody else in the world can have the car that you have. And that couldn't be more true with the fact that Rolls-Royce have so many special collection vehicles that are usually numbered and titled and have foot plates with the name of the car on. There are so many ways you can individualize and luxuryize probably not a word, your own Rolls-Royce. Well, we thought we'd have Jerry Spawn on to talk about the Rolls-Royce new Silver Bullet collection, which is the latest that that they have done with Dawn. Uh, Does this, of course, uh, become sold out the second it's announced, Jerry? (laughs) Hey, hey, Nick, it's good to be back. Um, It's um, Actually, there still are, I can tell you, there's still a couple of opportunities left for Silver Bullet. Um, but most of them have been spoken for. It's a, uh, it's a limited collection. We're only going to be building 50 silver bullets for everyone around the world. Most of them have been spoken for. Um, we were able to get a good allocation here for the U.S., a production, um, what we call, we call in a very vernacular production, production slots, but that means opportunities for our clients here. So um, it's a very rare, very, very cool dawn, and it's, it's just a gorgeous car. One of the things that you're pretty good at at Rolls-Royce is, uh, is numbering your vehicles. I know that uh, the Ghosts uh, that you announced at Pebble Beach a couple of years ago, I, I guess it's, it was the last Pebble Beach, uh, had a number on them or uh, they had a unique plate in the middle to show uh, their specialness. Uh, will these new silver bullet collections of the Dawn be numbered or will you just know what your number is? No, you'll know what your number is. You'll know where you stand. Uh, the very first one went to a very special uh, client of ours. Uh, 
um, who's uh, who's not not as promotional as some of our clients are, not as public as some of our clients are. He received the very first one, um, but you know, you'll know what you are in the, in the first fifty. What's really cool, what you're referring to, is it goes down to the collection, yeah. and there we do number those one through uh, one through fifty, and it's the last fifty to roll off the uh, to roll out of the doors of Goodwood Home of Rolls Royce, and so it's a. Um, yeah, it's a, it's a great way to know, and I, I can't. I'm not going to repeat what you said, but it's a great way to reiterate the individuality and uniqueness of every Rolls Royce. Right. Uh, I think we're blessed somewhat in the United States with Rolls Royce because uh, we have, you know, usually the, this is the majority of the cars. Of course, this is your biggest market. And when you go to some other companies like Hong uh, companies, countries like Hong Kong and and smaller countries around the world that have the elite uh, Rolls Royce collections by some of their best and youngest uh, business people they have to compete a little more to get theirs don't they so it's harder uh, to get them outside of the united states it, it is it's a global competition for very special rolls royce cars um what's what's great is though that everybody can i mean when we do a collection like this when we do an, an inspiration that there is there's a limited number of them but any owner can develop their own perfectly unique rolls royce commission uh, and many of them do. One of the reasons we do cars like Silver Bullet is to challenge not only our designers, but we do this design to challenge our clients and challenge the, their their client advisors and salespeople to think when they're bespoking their Rolls Royce, how do I put an arrow calling on my Dawn, or should I put one on my Dawn? Well, when you look at a Silver Bullet, you see just how cool it looks. You're thinking, okay. I may not want that, but I want a Dawn. I want an Arrow Collie. Maybe I'm going to do something slightly different. So all these are not merely, they're, they're not at all commercial exercises. They're exercises to get people to think uh, a little bit more and try some, try some new things when they're bespoke in their Rolls Royce. Tell me, give me a verbal picture of what the Rolls Royce Dawn Silver Bullet collection looked like. Well, it's... It's in a, it's a beautiful. I mean, as you can imagine, it's a beautiful silver finish on the uh, silver dawn. With um, uh, as I mentioned just a second ago, probably the most unique part of it is that it has a special bespoke arrow cowling, and the arrow cowling is a fiber. Um, I'm sorry, no, it's a carbon fiber uh, construction. And it covers the rear compartment, so it turns the sexiest, most social four seater into a really cool two seater roadster. Uh, you still and you still have all that functional room. Uh, we just have a beautiful the, the interior. There's two different options. There's a, uh, the white option and the darker option. Uh, just beautiful handcrafted leather, um, and it has uh, on the tread plate, as you mentioned, uh, it's commemorated as a member of the Dawn Silver Bullet collection. So it's probably an uncouth thing to ask, but what sort of uh, what sort of gelds will I have to hand over for one of these? Well, you know, as with any Rolls Royce, it's a commission, it's an investment. Um, the Silver Bullet is in the neighborhood, depending on where you are. Never see one number because also there's more things you can do to it. You can add additional bespoke to it, but you're looking in the, the mid four hundred thousands. Oh, I'll take two. Do you want one, Jen? Yes. Yeah. Please. <laughs> it is that you dog is beautiful. Too. Yeah. Wait, I, I have to. Pray. Yeah, I an can't air, guarantee you there's a third open. A, a car and a spare. Look at that. Uh, um, you know, I'd never turn down a Rolls Royce. I've never ever turned down a Rolls Royce in my life. It's they're uh, beautiful. Yeah, they're one of the best things. Well, uh, Jerry, if somebody wants one of these vehicles, should they proceed to their friendly local Rolls Royce dealer? You can visit your, your nearest Rolls Royce dealer and to find where that is, you could just go to RollsRoyceCars.com. That's RollsRoyceCars.com. That'll tell you where your nearest dealer is. Um, and you know, Nick, also, I don't, I don't want to miss out and we do have some big news coming this coming the, the next week and i do want to remind your listeners about that oh yeah there's, there's some dirty secrets out about a new rolls royce next week <laughs> <laughs> I, I really want to challenge everyone on tuesday is a very special day something we don't do very often although we've been doing a lot over the past 10 years we have a brand new rolls royce coming to market and you remember the family <laughs> that we're going to be revealing that's new ghost I'm... and if you want to watch that you can visit RollsRoyceCars.com and watch the live digital unveiling on Tuesday afternoon. Um, I'm but trying very work. hard not to say anything I shouldn't because, you know, I am. Just because no, you don't know it all. We can <laughs> <laughs> talk about it later. Yes. We will make, we'll make a date. For me, Nick. Yes, of course. Uh, we'll make a date. I I have a date. We'll, we'll make a date, Jerry, and, uh, and you can come back on and tell us all about this, this secret new Rolls-Royce. Jerry Swan is from Rolls-Royce Motorcars. Check out the new Rolls-Royce Dawn Silver Bullet Collection. I'm Nick Mike.
You're listening to the Our Auto Expert Podcast. This is our Auto Expert Radio Show on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. You can start a conversation with us, ask us a car question, just direct message us at Our Auto Expert. Our Auto Expert is where 2 million Americans get their automotive news daily. Joining us on the phone is our friend and the other half of Our Auto Expert, Mike Cadell. Mike has uh, been on a motorcycle adventure and is talking about doing horrendous things to his new Ducati. Are you still thinking about doing that? No. <laughs> Thank Absolutely goodness. not. Did your wife tell you that you were crazy about putting uh, putting a lift on your Ducati? No, but all my motorcycle friends said you don't you know you don't take an Italian supermodel to an off road expo. Yes, so, <laughs> correct. So yeah, so so yeah, it's uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna keep it the way it is. I'm gonna make a couple modifications to it. It's gonna be a touring bike. I might put some enduro tires on it, not off-road tires, kind of some multi-purpose tires on it so I can maybe hit some fire roads. But I think that the easy answer is, you know, spend maybe a thousand or two thousand bucks and buy a used dirt bike that's 10 years old and just go whip that around with my son. All right. There you go. TM is a good brand. Uh, yeah, um, I think Mike probably already has his the bikes lined up that he wants to buy. Tell us the story. It'll be a KTM. It'll Te- be a KTM 990. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> tell us the tell us the story of your adventures with uh, this motorcycle. Uh, um, I guess it was a, cl- a class or a course. Academy. Yeah, Academy. yeah. So I was on with you guys the week before. I left for Greenville, South Carolina, and I was at the BMW US Rider Academy, which is you know hosted by. BMW, and it's it's where they have both their four wheel performance driving course, and they have their two wheel street and off road course. I chose the two day off road course on a BMW uh, 1250. It's a GS R1250, so it's their enduro motorcycle. And to be perfectly honest, guys, I I was really surprised how much I learned and what I took away from it, the things that we do on a daily basis, those that ride motorcycles that we do wrong. Um, the bike was amazing. I've already put in emails to BMW saying, Hey, what are the chances of me getting one of those bikes? Like, can I buy one, like a beat up one? But the bikes were amazing. You learned how to, you know, make your way through three, four feet of water, uh, up over gravel pits, uh, down through ravines and, you know, they really they really work hard on getting you from the start on Saturday morning to the end on Sunday of being a relatively competent motorcycle rider. Um, and I learned a lot. I highly recommend the U.S. Rider Academy. It is something that changed the way I look at motorcycling. Do you, how many bikes do you have now? Two. So I have a 2003 Harley-Davidson Dyna. Uh, it's our Dyna Glide, so it's a smaller bike. And then I have... Uh, the Ducati Multistrada 1200S Touring. All right. Well, wait. Bike. Wait till you get a third one, yeah, and I just give you the how uh, you have to do this. You have to take one in for service, oh, and when you take it in for service, you have to t- pick up the new bike and bring it back and park it in the garage. And then when you get the one back from service, you bring it back, and then your wife says, oh, why are there three bikes in the garage about two weeks later, which is what happened to me. Mm-hmm. And then you get chastised for spending money you didn't ask. That's, That's right, exactly. Well, I already did that on the Ducati. I bought it without asking, so I'm already in trouble with that one. But if I wind my son into the conversation, hey, honey, we're going to go dirt bike riding together, then it then it becomes okay. Wait, are you hiding your addiction for buying motorcycles under family time? Yes, I, I totally <laughs> use that as a Smart perfect justice. <laughs> oh, dude, you, you just, you've got it going. Uh, is, is there a lot of people that do off-road bike riding uh, like you did on the BMW course? Is, it, is there, you know, because there's huge amounts of people that love overlanding. Is that a thing with sure. bikes? Yeah, so part of me going out there to, to do this was doing a news segment on it. And so I had to kind of pre- prepare myself with some of the research and the information. And so I went through the Motorcycle Industry Council, it's kind of like the authority on everything motorcycling. And they spit back some numbers at me. So as far as off-roading in total means dirt bikes and enduros and adventure bikes, they're up about 50% year over year during the coronavirus pandemic. So people are wanting to get out and enjoy nature. Enduro adventure overlanding bikes like what I was on, they're up about 20%. And the industry as a whole is up roughly 7%. So all the numbers are north. You can't buy motorcycles right now because people are just, they've already gone in during the, the pandemic knowing they were going to be home. And a lot of people are spending time on two wheels because it's a way they can socially distance themselves. And you 
still enjoy the bike. But yeah, that information I got from them was was impactful. And by by the way, I'll I'll just note this really fast that if you are looking to get into motorcycling, the Motorcycle Safety Foundation, so MSF dash I think it's MSF dash USA dot org. There are forty four states in the country that all offer some form of motorcycle training. Highly, highly recommend going through the MSF course, learn how to become a safer, better motorcyclist, and always wear your gear. Yeah. I Well, the summer's pretty hard to wear your gear, all of it, but uh, I went through the safety course before I got my first bike, so I, I would also recommend that as well. Uh, you know, I'm thinking about this for your son. How old is he? 13. 13. I think a Honda Grom would be perfect for him. Just saying. That's what it, I, it could be. It I have be. one. Maybe I'll buy yours. Yeah, buy no, yours. I, I have one, and well, you just send him up. He can go ride it around if he likes it. What? How long? How old do you have to be uh, in your state to get a, a motorcycle license? Is it like fifteen and a half or yeah, something? Yeah, so we. Yep, yep, we're right in that. We're right in that same wheelhouse with the rest of the the, the states. But um, I want him on the dirt first. It's one thing I never learned as a kid was dirt. I'm I'm learning dirt as an adult, and I think if you can learn the the core foundational element of riding on the dirt is going to make you a better street rider. So we're going to put him on the dirt and let him let him do some ripping around on a dirt bike. Hey, yeah, I hey agree. Hey, Mike, next time you're here uh, and you bring your son, let me know because one of my really good friends is an instructor. So It's awesome. Yeah, let's yeah we're going to go do the MSF course in Atlanta next month. Nice. It's going to be fun. That's yeah. Great. Um, so when when is his birthday? He just had it, didn't he? Second. Yeah, so yeah, Christmas. I wonder what's that. I wonder what that big. You better start buying wrapping paper now because you got a lot to wrap. I know. I know. I know. Oh, and did you hear Nick is gonna buy me a Senna? Senna, right? A McLaren Senna <laughs> for Christmas. I did. Yep, that's what I heard. That's the rumor. The rumor uh -huh. is it's coming. He also promised me a Lamborghini. Uh -huh. Very. Cool. You guys are getting toy ones. However, <laughs> I'm getting the real one. <laughs> So there you go. Uh, you, the trouble with off-road riding, and not the trouble, but one of the things you also have to consider is the gear is probably as important as the bike, right? Very important. Absolutely. Yeah. No, you have to get your shifting together, and you have to, you know, you're using your left hand to, to pull the clutch in, your left foot to shift the bike. You're going down one into first gear and then rifling through them coming up into the other gears. So you, you, you kind of have to get it all all figured out you know to, to become more of a competent rider but it's important man doing those figure eights like they teach you at the msf course is uh super important do you know what i had the hardest time with and when i took the course is the cones you know going slowly yeah, around the cones right. without putting my foot down that was the hardest thing and they don't it set they don't get your eyes up yeah they don't set the cone in a in a letter v they set the cone like so you have to almost come backwards to go around the outside cones. correct and that yeah, is, that's how they do it. yeah. And I'm like, you cheaters, <laughs> cheating, making yeah, it harder for me. It. They want you. They want you to move the bike off of your body. They want you to move opposite, so your body goes opposite direction of the bike. It's tough. It's a crazy um, thing. It's tough, but it's a whole lot of fun. Uh, in the time we have left, let's talk a little bit about uh, the Lincoln Black Label, which you've been driving. Wow, my wife's pissed. <laughs> She's so pissed. We went and bought a different car right before uh, the pandemic started, and. When I brought this home, she is like, wow, I really like it. So uh, I have the Lincoln Black Label. Um, yeah. So, so what, Lincoln Aviator Black Label. Aviator, okay. Edition. Yeah, sorry. What did I say? Well, I just said, we just said Black Label. So did I, but I didn't know if it was the... Aviator. Yeah, the Navigator or the Aviator. So the Aviator Black Label. Yeah. Yep, Bla Aviator Black Label. This thing was amazing. Absolutely go online and Google this thing. It had incredible interior, super soft, like plush leather. Uh, beautiful touch screen, running all the Sync 4 technology from Ford, adaptive cruise control, lane departure warning, front crash avoidance, like everything that you want from a tech standpoint is in the vehicle, but it's really all about the, the luxury and what's under the hood. So the powertrain, this was a plug-in, this is a plug-in hybrid electric vehicle, has a three liter twin turbo motor under the hood, and that thing moves. It is so fun to drive. Uh, I think Ford knocked it out of the park with this, with the Lincoln Aviator, and I think it's it's something that, just in general standpoint, you know, starting at, you know, sixty nine grand is is a lot, right? It's a lot of money, but if you're comparing it in that competitive segment, I think they're I think they're one of the top two or three uh, as one of my favorites. Uh, the Lincoln have done a really good job with the interiors of their vehicles, haven't they? They have. So they you know they went with this baseball like grade leather like that. 
beautiful, rich, brown look on the interior. Uh, they went with the seats. They call them perfect position seats. And these perfect position seats are super thin, but you can adjust them to literally get it into that exact position that you want. So I'm six foot three, and what's great is it has leg extenders on both the driver and passenger side so that I can, I can basically keep, you know, the, the secondary part of, you know, my, my thigh down to my knee also on the chair. So it gives you more stability, more comfort. Panorama sunroof, which is really cool for the kids in the back. It does have a third row. It's functional, you know, for maybe a, a short hop to the airport and back uh, to maybe pick some folks up, but you're not going to put two adults back there. Uh, the raked uh, B pillar, so that's the second doors on back, has this incredible cool rake to look to it. Uh, they did a great job with this thing, man. It's all about flight. They want to integrate the thought of flight into their vehicles. Obviously, the name Aviator kind of denotes that. But everything they've done with that vehicle is, is a standout. The one that I drove, take a deep breath, Jen, about hundred grand. Uh, oh. It was expensive. But it was, it was stunning, and there will be a, a good percentage of people that buy that vehicle because of what it is, and it is amazing. Um, all you have to do when your wife complains that she didn't get one is wave the uh, Maroni in front of her and say, that's why you didn't get one, honey. It's $100,000. There, <laughs> there you go. Right, uh, if you want to see Mike's videos, go to OurAutoExpert.com. You'll see him on TV stations, national and local, all around the country with his segments. Also, make sure that you sign up and listen to previous episodes of the podcast. You're listening to Our Auto Expert. Your smart speaker can be your radio. Just say, hey, Google, or hey, Alexa, or hey, Siri, play Our Auto Expert radio show. And all the previous episodes of the show, podcast, will be available. Hours of endless fun for your family. I'm Nick Miles, and this is Our Auto Expert radio show, where two million Americans get their automotive news daily. This week in my driveway, I have had uh, two vehicles that I've been testing. Uh, one of them is the 2020 Ford Ranger. Of course, this came out last year. It's the new smaller pickup. The Ranger took a hiatus from sales in the United States, but it's back. Uh, the Ford Ranger midsize pickup uh, is built, of course, Ford Tough. It's ready for adventure. It's packed with driver assistance technology, easily enabling driving uh, both on and off-road. Uh, and it's anchored by the strength of the steel frame and powered by a 2.3-liter EcoBoost engine with 270 horsepower and 310 pounds-feet of torque. It's paired to an efficient 10-speed automatic transmission, the transmission the all-new ranger is available in either a super cab or super crew configuration and it can be optioned with 4x2 or 4x4 and comes in three trim levels the xl the xlt and the lariat the stylish black classic chrome and slick sports appearance packages are available as well for this now uh, the new ranger fx2 the which is kind of a sports package, I guess a sporty off-road package. It has styling and upgrades the capabilities uh, from the two uh, of the two of the different trim levels, including uh, giving you an electronic locking rear differential for off-road and off-road tuned suspension as well, uh, front underbody guards and Ford's off-road cluster screen, which actually makes it very easy um, to drive off-road. The technology comes built in, starting with an 8-inch touch screen available with the Sync 3 system from Ford, while a single or a dual LCD productivity screen is available for real-time vehicle navigation and audio information. The Ranger has uh, standard pre-collision assist with automatic emergency braking, a lane-keeping system that includes lane-keeping assist, lane departure warning, and the reserve, reverse sensing and class-exclusive blind spot information system with uh, tailored cover, uh, with the trailer coverage of the back, which is really cool. So those systems actually cover it when you're towing a trailer. That's standard on the XLT and the Lariat, and the adaptive cruise control is also standard on the Lariat as well. So that's Ford's new vehicle. Vehicle, I will tell you, the on-road drive is a little rough, um, especially if you sit in the back seat. It's a little bumpy. Enough power in that 2.3-liter EcoBoost engine, and the inside is well kitted out. I like the fact that they have things like LED lighting around the USB ports, which really makes a huge difference if you're trying to plug your phone in in the dark. I've also been driving the quickest and most fuel-efficient RAV4 ever. It's at dealerships right now. It's the uh, Toyota RAV4 Prime, and that's their plug-in hybrid version it'll be uh, it is really a groundbreaking toyota 
uh, hitting dealerships right now. Uh, starting MSRP of this is uh, fairly heavy. It's thirty-eight thousand one hundred dollars. Now it does qualify for the federal $7,500 tax credit. And depending on where you live, you can also get state and city uh, reductions in that price as well with tax reductions. Uh, there are places in California where you can get huge amounts of money back, uh, possibly another $7,000 off of this vehicle. The RAV's first ever plug-in model uh, has, uh, the RAV4's first ever plug-in model has up to 302 horsepower with the ability to do 0 to 60 miles an hour in around 5.7 seconds. And I think that makes it the quickest four-door model in Toyota's lineup. Uh, the only vehicle that's actually faster at 0 to 60 or quicker 0 to 60 is the Supra. Uh, the RAV4 Prime also has uh, a very sort of cool manufacturing uh, um, estimated battery mileage of around 42 uh, miles on just the electricity alone. Round trip to the station and to get lunch and coffee and things like that today for us means we won't actually use any of the gas power whatsoever. Uh, mine did show 35 miles this morning when I pulled it out of the driveway on electricity alone. If you look at the fuel economy of the RAV4 Prime, uh, it's an estimated 94 combined MPGE, that's miles per gallon equivalent. Even more uh, of things than that set it apart. It has the all-wheel drive system in it as well, and the rear wheel is powered by electricity alone. The fir it was first revealed at the LA Sh Auto Show in 2019. And the uh, the 2021 RAV4 Prime will be available in an SE and an XSE grade, both emphasizing the athletic on-the-road performance and the premium comfort and style. So you can check it out. Uh, it has a lot of things in its standard. Uh, you can see things like LED accent lights on the XSE grade, uh, paddle shifters, moonroof, uh, soft text trim seat surfaces, uh, wireless charging, ambient lighting on the interior, auto dimming rear view mirror. Uh, plus, it has a huge 9-inch touchscreen on the XSE version as well. Plus, great JBL audio system and digital rear view mirror, power outlets, everything you could possibly ex expect, including some very cool kick plates as well for that vehicle. So there is an awful lot on that. I will tell you that it is, to me, much more sporty than the RAV4 Hybrid, which I also got an opportunity to drive uh, recently. And the RAV4 Prime, the plug-in hybrid, uh, is I, I would say a lot better vehicle uh, when it comes to performance as well. Wanted to mention that uh, under coronavirus, General Motors is using salaried employees to keep their Missouri plant open as assembly line uh, workers call out sick due to the coronavirus. Uh, they're using those salaried empl employees to fill in the positions of hourly union assembly line workers absent due, due to the coronavirus. Uh, the use of salaried employees as Missouri Missouri's plant uh, draws uh, up their production work, getting back to producing vehicles, uh, has all been sanctioned by everyone. And this practice is fairly uncommon when it comes to unionized workers, but it's not unprecedented. Uh, and I wanted to give a big thumbs up for those guys who are coming in and trying to keep the plant going and making sure that we can get cars. I talked to a few dealers over the last week or so, and the biggest thing that they complain about constantly, no stock. So if you, I, we drive past a huge car sale um, lot when we come to the radio station, and usually they have all the cars parked in the, the parallel parking spaces, and they probably have what six hundred cars out there, something like that. Easy. I notice they're angle parked now across the spaces to make it look like they have more cars than they actually Taking have. Taking up two, three spaces. Yeah, yeah. They're, they're cheating, uh, but it's because we don't have the the vehicles available. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think the last time I looked at the J.D. Power numbers, we're about 5% down for what was pre-COVID predi COVID predictions in car sales. So car sales are actually pretty uh, solid right now. Uh, used car sales are up about 3%. Luxury car sales up about 3%. So ostensibly, we're probably about flat. But the, what people are buying has changed. Much more trucks and SUVs. In fact, those small trucks like Ford Ranger are now the vehicle of choice. They're up. They're selling more than they were uh, pre-COVID predictions as well. Uh, did you enjoy your ride in the RAV4 Prime? Yes, I like the RAV4 a lot. Isn't it? Isn't that backup sound really annoying? Oh yeah. yeah. Toyota have installed a backup <laughs> sound in their electric vehicles because when you back up, it's ostensibly silent, and it sounds like grinding brakes. It does. Yeah. Uh, it's like fingers on a chalkboard. Yeah. Something like that. 
It could be worse, Nick. It could be worse. It could. Well, explain to me what would be worse than fingers on a chalkboard, Jan. Wow, I didn't really have to think about that. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to talk about the 2020 Hyundai Santa Fe Limited when we come back. Uh, that vehicle, by the way, has that rear seat reminder. All that as our auto expert continues. You're listening to the Our Auto Expert Podcast. Locally created, nationally celebrated from the northwest to the southeast, this is America's Car Radio Show. If it has a throttle, we'll feature it on air, online, on smartphone, or on smart speaker. This is Our Auto Expert, where two million Americans get their automotive news daily. I'm your host, Nick Miles, along with truck girl Jen. Recently out of the press fleet, I got to drive the new 2020 Hyundai Sonata. Uh, Of course, Hyundai have been making great news with their rear seat reminder system and wanting to put that in all of their vehicles, or as many as possible by 2022 uh, it, and it has this in it but they've upgraded that system as well now they have a new version of it that actually senses motion in the back of the vehicle but who better to talk to us than an expert who is a product planner from uh, Hyundai Motors uh, Melvin Batista is joining us on the phone to talk a little bit about the 2020 Santa Fe uh, the rear seat reminder is definitely a good reason to buy this vehicle isn't it Melvin Yes, it is. Uh, it actually has um, a lot of great features to it. Um, there's actually two different kinds of the rear, uh, you know, the occupant, occupant alert system. Um, but yeah, basically it uh, detects uh, when you leave a child or person in the back seat or as well as an animal, uh, it gives you a warning on there and you go to the higher trim levels and it actually gives you a beep. It gives you a notification on your smartphone um, to make sure that you don't leave them in there. Can you make sure that when I leave my keys at the supermarket, uh, my uh, my phone beeps as well, which I do quite regularly. It's a, <laughs> it, nobody wants to think about the fact that the children get left in the rear seat of cars. You know, it, it takes just a few minutes for the inside temperature of a car to get about 20 degrees hotter than the outside. Uh, and no one wants to think about the 53 uh, kids that perish every year in the back seat. But ultimately, this is a great way to stop it. Now, if there's movement... The car senses it, doesn't it? Yes, it does. Uh, like I mentioned, it, it honks um, it honks the horn, it, it, it flashes the lights, and uh, it gives you a text message and, and reminds you uh, that, that you've left something in the back car. <laughs> Uh, so let's talk about the, the vehicle in general. Uh, the, you know, Hyundai, of course, want to, uh, want to make sure that you have a vehicle that has an outstanding warranty. And I do remember talking to somebody who worked for Hyundai's uh, marketing agency back when you introduced your 10-year, 100,000-mile warranty. And they weren't sure it would be uh, really taken up by customers. But everybody I talk to, that's the one thing that attracts them to the brand, first of all, is the fact is you're willing to stand by your behind your products and that warranty has been just one of many things that hyundai have offered that's really paid off to get the people's attention into the brand hasn't it yes it has um you know we still to date have america's uh, best warranty coverage um in addition to that you know we've taken the initiative of making all of our um you know hyundai smart sense advanced safety features standard as well in our vehicles uh newly developed blind uh, blind view monitor is now standard on the limited models as well Yes, and it's really a great feature. Um, it actually uses the same system as our surround view monitor um, system, but in this case, um, it's actually really cool. You know, you have other competitors that have blind spot detection, and it gives you audible alerts, and it gives you light flashes, um, but this one takes it to the next level. Uh, it actually, when you activate uh, each side of your turn signal, it gives you a, a view um, on the monitor in your center display of the vehicle so that you can see what's coming up in your blind spot. I can't imagine... After you, I've driven with this a little while. I can't imagine ever driving a car without it. Although uh, I think some of these features probably make me a lazy driver because I probably should look over my shoulder a little more. Uh, but now I just tend to rely on what appears in the dash instead. Uh, rear cross traffic uh, collision avoidance system as well. How many times have you been backing out of a parking space and uh, as someone walks behind your car at the uh, Home Depot or at Lowe's uh, and now it will detect that and it will also help you avoid hitting them, won't it? Yeah, and it's actually, um, you know, a part of every day of my life. You know, every time I get in the car living in Los Angeles, uh, you've got a ton of traffic. You've got a ton of people walking around. Uh, but, yeah, definitely uh, the other unique thing about it as well is, is the blind spot collision avoidance system. It kind of works in the same ways and with, with the rear cross traffic uh, avoidance. Um, it actually applies the brakes as needed if it detects 
something as well. And, and, and like I mentioned on the blind spot, you know, you're driving on the freeway, you're getting all these audible alerts. The system also has the ability to apply the brakes as well so that you can uh, help prevent a, a collision. Uh, I like that, too, because, you know, I can lose concentration sometimes when I'm driving. Uh, wireless, charging, yeah, wireless charging now added on the SEL uh, with convenience and above. Uh, but let's talk about the design of the Santa Fe. I think a lot of people overlook this design. One of the things that I learned, I think it was on the Elantra launch in uh, Vegas a couple of years ago around SEMA when you guys launched that vehicle there, that uh, Hyundai uh, is actually a steel company. They, are, they were best known for uh, their steel uh, smelting plants, and all of the Hyundai grills grew out of the shape of those smelters, the great big steel smelters. That's why the grill was originally shaped the way it was to signify that they were a steel company. Um, and it's still sort of, sort of true today, isn't it? That's still the original form of the steel smelter still exists in the front grills. Yes, it's become one of our signature elements um, on our vehicles. It's, it's kind of a three-dimensional kind of cascading grill that we've applied on all of our vehicles. And uh, we continue to do that um, as well with, with a lot of the feature products that we have coming up. I always like the fact that I see the front of a car as almost a face, you know, the headlights being the eyes and the grill being the yeah. mouth and the emblem being the nose. And I always think about Hyundai's has always got a cheeky grin on them. Some other cars look like they're <laughs> about to cry and sad faces or a bull nose, but, but Hyundai's always have that sort of cheeky, smiley grin on the front of them as well. Uh, pretty well powered as well uh, with, the, uh, with the new Santa Fe. You've got a choice of, is it a 2.4 liter and then the two two liter uh turbo yes it's a 2.4 liter uh gdi engine uh, that's standard that comes with about 185 horsepower and then uh obviously you get the much more powerful uh two liter turbocharged engine that has 235 horsepower and i noticed how smooth it was driving it around town and on the freeway and to help that you actually have uh, put an eight speed transmission in it yeah, the eight-speed automatic transmission actually uh, it, it's very sh it shifts really quickly. It's very crisp, uh, very quiet as you're accelerating and decelerating. Uh, they've done a really good job on uh, implementing a lot of measures, um, you know, to make the, the ride as comfortable and um, as, as more engaging as, as, as can be. When we talk about convenience and technology, uh, a lot of family cars, as I like to call them, we're used to seeing heads-up displays in luxury cars, but they don't often appear in family cars. But you've managed to put a heads-up display in the new Santa Fe. Yeah, and what's actually really cool about it, it actually projects onto the windshield, so it doesn't give you the little clear glass that kind of stands up, um, you know, as, as a, a few of the competitors have, but it actually gives you a clear, crisp, uh, to eight and a half inch uh, display on the windshield, um, and it actually uh, shows a ton of uh, features, you know, whether it be the speed limit, uh, some of the safety features when they're activated, uh, it gives you the audible warnings on there, it gives you radio displays. Um, you know, just a ton of information in there just to make sure that we can keep our drivers uh, keeping their eyes on the road at all times. Now, with Apple CarPlay and Android Auto being such a big part of many people's lives, uh, a lot of people tend to forget about the Blue Link system that Hyundai have. So give us sort of an overview uh, of the Blue Link system and uh, how it works, Melvin. Yeah, absolutely. So this is our uh, Blue Link Connected Car Services. Um, and, you know, there's three packages that they're kind of divided into, but we give you a three-year complimentary, um, you know, trial of all three of these uh, services. But one of them is the Connected Car Services, where basically it gives you a lot of the safety stuff. So certain things like if you get into a collision, uh, it gives a notification to the emergency services. Uh, you can also reach out and call emergency services you know, if you're getting, getting to an accident, your, flow, your phone flies across the, the car, uh, you still have a button that's mounted on the rearview mirror that gives you the ability to contact um, emergency services. Um, in addition to that, you're able to get some diagnostic information, some uh, maintenance. You can set your appointments, um, you know, through the Blue Link system. Um, and remotely, you can remote start your car um, with the climate control, either heating or cooling the cabin prior to you getting into the vehicle. Um, you could also uh, remote lock or unlock the vehicle if you forget to do that. There's also a uh, stolen vehicle recovery. There's um, certain features that, that we call a geofence. Um, you know, one thing is you got my kids, my teenage son driving down the road. It actually can give me um, a warning that says, hey, he's driving over the speed limit, and I can give him a call and tell him to slow down. So, um, you know, the other side of it, there's also guidance features. Um, where, you know, you can get voice by, uh, again, through the push of a button. Uh, you can get some voice uh, guidance on directions um, and certain things like that. 
But the great thing about it is it all kind of ties in with your smartphone and your car. So you have that connection whether you're in your car or out of your car. I, I like it would probably be even better if your son got a warning, first of all, from the car said, I'm going to call your dad. If you don't slow yeah, down, exactly. <laughs> uh, uh, and and I can't wait until the day that you can actually disable the car um, and make the kid only he can only drive home, which I think would be great. Uh, I, I think the best feature out of it is though being able to operate it from the smartwatch because that is definitely I spy kind of stuff. Yes, it definitely is. And again, you know, we're just trying to get you know in today's world, everybody wants to be connected. They have to be connected, um, and it's just one one additional step that we're allowed. Uh, you know, allowing our customers to, to connect with their vehicles, you know, basically 24 hours a day. I love it. I love all the things about it. Uh, availability and price of the new Hyundai Santa Fe. Yeah, so basically the vehicle starts a little bit over 26000 and fully loaded with all the best bells and whistles, uh, it tops out a little bit under 40000 And uh, they're in dealerships right now, I guess. Yes, they are. They're uh, in full swing uh, with the 2020 model year vehicles. And, uh, yes, they are available at all our dealerships today. Uh, how are we doing with stock? Uh, you know, we're actually doing pretty well. You know, obviously, with everything going on in the world today, um, you know, Hyundai's actually been uh, doing fairly well uh, when it comes to, to sales and, and, and loading up our inventory and giving our dealers, um, you know, the tools so that they can make these sales to the customers. Excellent. Melvin Batista is an account assistant manager at the product planning for Hyundai Motors, talking about the new 2020 Hyundai Santa Fe. Uh, I really enjoyed my test drive of it, too. It's clean. It's easy to drive. It's got loads of technology, and it looks pretty smart as well. It's definitely on the shopping list if you're looking for that size of SUV. Stand by. Our auto expert is going to continue, and you will love what we have coming up. You're listening to Our Auto Expert. Catch up with previous episodes of the show on our website, ourautoexpert.com. You can hear all past shows, see our automotive videos, and read insider car stories about your next ride. Our Auto Expert is where 2 million Americans get their automotive news daily. You'll find it all at ourautoexpert.com. I actually uh, love the fact that uh, the new Volvo XC90 was one of those cars that kind of stimulated a lot of the competition to really push and upgrade their large uh, flagship SUVs. Uh, and there is many reasons why Volvo was kind of ahead of the curve. Uh, one of those reasons is because Volvo had this big open space in which they had ended their uh, association with Ford and they had an open book to really uh, reinvent them themselves and they had no choice but to start producing a lot of their uh, new models without help from a large parent company um, and they really did a great job in doing that and joining us on the phone to talk about the brand new or the new XC90 is Russell Datz. It's always uh, enjoyable to have you along. How have you been surviving the pandemic my friend? So I'm avoiding a plague like a plague, Nick. Good to talk to you again. <laughs> you, you too. Uh, you have a saying, and I, I, I wanted to quote it, but I can't remember what it is uh, and why Volvo did such a good job of reinventing themselves because they didn't have much choice, did they? No, it was it was do or die for Volvo. You know, um, Ford. Uh, the Ford ownership was great, but they decided to end that. And once they did, uh, we saw a real need to leapfrog the industry in order to survive and prosper. So what we did is we, we took a whole new approach to our product lineup, of course, in integrating all the safety there ever was at Volvo for nearly 100 years at that point, and, and moved up into the luxury space competing with the other European brands there. Yeah, I love the fact that uh, you know Ford said, "Well, you're no longer able to have our our uh, larger engines, which we make in our factories, which you had uh, taken and adapted to use in many Volvos." So you were left with the four-cylinder engines, and it, you turn what could have been a tragedy for a car company into something extremely powerful because you managed to reunite them or unite those engines and the new four-cylinder engines with sort of electric hybrid powertrains. And what you ended up with was far superior to what you had before. It was, and it was, we weren't left with anything. We had to create an entirely new powertrain strategy, platform strategy, product strategy. So what we did was we looked, you know, 10, 20 years into the future uh, and tried to, I think it was Wayne Gretzky used to say, I'm not playing the puck where it is, I'm playing the puck where it's going to be. Right. And 
that's what we were looking at doing. So we we knew that in order to meet the coming emissions regulations, we had to go with more efficient engines because we knew what products they were going to be driving and we had to get the most out of them. So the four-cylinder engine strategy was very deliberate um, and it's proven to be very successful for us. And, and I think the vehicles uh, are outstanding in their own right. Every time I seem to open my email, there seems to be another award that the XC90 or that Volvo is is getting. What do you think is the magic source to make the XC90 such an... Well, I mean, there's a lot of amazing vehicles in the lineup. Uh, you know, the wagons, the Polestars, the XC60s, uh, you know, the XC40 has been groundbreaking. What's the secret source over at Volvo? Well, I think, you know, by playing the puck where it was going to be, we did that very successfully. Um, and we did look at the market, and we knew that safety still resonated very strongly with consumers for the Volvo brand. In fact, uh, a recent study from Strategic Vision says that Volvo is seen as the best brand that stands for safety by both owners and non-owners. So we knew we had that. What we didn't have was design and technology. So we really put a lot of effort into those characteristics of our new product lineup to appeal to the luxury consumers that were coming from those other European brands that expected that level of design and technology. So connectivity, uh, you know, touchscreen interfaces, uh, Scandinavian design, where Volvo is the only brand really that can claim its own national identity or cultural identity. Uh, all other manufacturers, they share it. Right. And Volvo has kept it very pure. And I think it, you also over at Volvo made it cool to be green before, you know, it was cool to be green in a sense, too. And even now, saving sort of up to 15 cents, uh, uh, you know, the drivers can save up to 15 cents per fuel, or fuel cost of savings on emission reductions uh, in real world driving times. It wasn't just about what you thought the vehicle was going to do. And then plus, you've sort of given it all of this new technology spin as well. The XC90 had some very groundbreaking technologies that a company 50 times the size wasn't making. Uh, it did, and I think that's a, a testament to the way, to the independence that the, the company has always um, tried to achieve. You know, the, the safety aspect of things is where we excel, and when we did reintroduce the, the, the product lineup, the, the uh, scalable product architecture, which underpins all of our new vehicles, um, we didn't slow down in the safety department. Uh, we have had close to 20 world firsts in safety to date, uh, starting with, you know, laminated glass and a three-point safety belt, which is now ubiquitous in every car in the world. We estimate it saved at least a million lives, and we hope to save a million more in the coming years. Um, but things that are not really as visible, like runoff road protection in the XC90, which is a technology uh, that resulted from our accident investigation team that we've had uh, on the job in Sweden since the 1970s that actually goes out and uh, and investigates accidents and brings back real-world data that can be turned into practical applications like this runoff road uh, uh, system, which is actually a crumple zone in the seats, a vertical crumple zone. Uh, what we found was Many single car accidents were a result of cars leaving the road, uh, people falling asleep or avoiding another an obstacle in the road. They would roll off, uh, drive off the road, go down into a berm, and then they get launched up in the air and come down very hard. And all that en vertical energy was being transferred into their spinal cords, causing incredible back injuries. So we developed a, a uh, crumple zone in the seat to shed energy away from uh, spinal cords and help protect people that way. Um, the, the the Swedish nature is not to be braggarts about things like that, so it's not often talked about, right. but it's there. Right. Uh, Russell, uh, just one of 90 reasons that I really do love the XC90. I'm going to be test driving uh, the new one come very soon, and I will definitely uh, tell you how I feel about it, but I think you probably already know from this interview. Russell Datz is uh, one of the PR team at Volvo Cars, and the new XC90 is on lots right now. 2021 pricing just been announced, too, so they're going to keep the five-star safety rating and the uh, five-star luxury going on the new XC90. Stand by. More Our Auto Expert on the way. You're listening to the Our Auto Expert Podcast.
Yep, make sure you check out our auto expert on uh, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. You can start a conversation with us and ask us car questions. Just direct message us at our auto expert. Our auto expert is where two million Americans get their automotive news daily, and many more get their automotive news every week from our TV and uh, videos online and on broadcast stations around the United States. Um, I have much love in my heart for our next guest, who uh, I have been friends with for, for many, many years and uh, his career has accelerated much faster than I could hope mine would. But uh, he is now the big cheese over at Jeep, which is exactly where he belongs. We have many loves that we share, including uh, rescuing animals, which he seems to do an awful lot of in his spare time. He's always telling me about the latest animal that uh, has been brought home by a member of his family. Jim Morrison is uh, in charge of Jeep, and he's doing an incredible job. Uh, Have you rescued anything recently, Jim? No, Nick, I haven't. Um, but I was in my barn this morning, and and uh, a, a uh, one of our rescue cats jumped on top of me, and I uh, and I thought about you. Um, <laughs> and uh, yeah, there's always uh, there's always something going on well, at the uh, at the Morrison farm. There isn't a better. Uh, I guess vehicle to have uh, rescue animals than a jeep because uh, it's the perfect vehicle to go off roading and uh, get up to where some of these animals need the most help. And uh, Jeep has sort of updated the the new truck, the Gladiator, and you've given it a or you've given it a new powertrain. Yes, for sure, we have uh, a new uh, eco diesel in our in our Gladiator. And in fact, uh, to connect the dots, there was an article last weekend, and someone said, uh, "Give me a picture of." Um, uh, of your jeep with your dogs in it so there's my uh, my two rescue dogs in the back of the uh the gladiator in the backyard of my uh my farm here so doors off top off and uh dog smiling so it was a pretty cool pick the the gladiator it, it was kind of a tough deal i think for you guys because in a sense to the the, jeep, the whole jeep mantra is to make sure to go where nobody else can go really and that's what the wrangler has always been able to do and um, people have been begging and asking for a diesel for a long time and you gave them a diesel wrangler but the the truck idea was you had to build something which it wasn't just sticking a bed on the back of the gladiator to make it in you know, or the wrangler to make it into a truck you had to really make sure that it performed uh without uh, any anybody losing their expectations didn't you yeah for sure it needed to be a jeep first which meant it needed to go wherever you uh, want it to go and then it needed to be a real truck too so you know, we've done that with, you know, 1,700 pounds of payload and 7,600 pounds of towing. It's a real truck, um, but we do that in a way that makes it the most capable midsize truck ever. So all of the uh, Gladiators are 4 by 4 of course, as you can imagine, and, and very capable. So you can put your stuff in it. You know, you can work it um, hard. It actually uh, works really hard as a truck. I've, you know, uh, used it to, uh, you know, throw grain in the back, used it to wheel around and, and pull out um you know, people that are stuck or use it around the farm, or you, you can use it to go wheeling and have a lot of fun uh, as well. So if you work it hard or play hard, the, uh, the Gladiator has got you covered. Now, I did mention something when you had the Gladiator uh, launch just outside of Sacramento. Um, I did ask uh, one of your uh, marketing guys, why, why don't you just put a third row in it and, uh, and make it a three-row vehicle? And everything went really silent. Did I touch a yeah, nerve? That's an, that's an interesting <laughs> uh, concept, yeah. Uh, I think I've seen the pictures of the concept, uh, the Moab Easter Jeep Safari uh, version uh, in Utah, the gray one, uh, the the Gladiator truck, and it looks just unbelievable. Like, I I want to own it. This is It still allows people to, even if you get the truck version, to add all these accessories on and have a real go-to anywhere vehicle that has so much low-end torque. Well, that's the nice thing about the uh, the diesel is it's got lots of torque. So, you notice that uh, Jeep had 37 inch tires on it, and and you know a, a, a tent on the top, and you know and everything you wanted to do to make it a, an overlanding expert. And think of uh, how that combines with all the torque that we have in our Eco Diesel. You can get over 500 miles uh, range with the thing, and uh, and it's and it's uh, an incredible combination that really nobody else has in the marketplace. Anything that's even close. One of the challenges you always have at Jeep, and you know, I've, I've talked to uh, several people over at the company. The biggest challenge I think you always have is 
you make everything so durable. You make your parts much more durable, much heavier. You give it more steel around. You give it more housing to make sure if rocks get uh, hit underneath that the vehicle will be able to sustain and still keep going. Um, the biggest problem with that is it tends to make the vehicles a little heavier and a little more bulky to get around. But the EPA, the fuel economy on this new Jeep Gladiator diesel with the 3-liter turbocharged 6 in it, is pretty reasonable, isn't it? Yeah, we're 25 miles per gallon is the uh, is the rating for uh, for the Gladiator with the uh, Eco Diesel in it, and I can tell you because I'm driving one right now, it's easy to pull 25, and you can push it really hard and still get 25, and you push it even harder, you know, with more of a load and it still gets 25. I'm thinking, man, oh man, this is uh, incredible. But the engineers have done a really good job integrating it uh, into. Uh, into the Gladiator, it shifts well. It's got lots of uh, low end torque. It smooths off the line, and uh, it's a uh, it's a great powertrain. Do you think uh, that? Well, who do you think the customer is going to be for this? Is it going to be the off road community? Because I know that the when you came out with the Wrangler diesel, it was the first vehicle to uh, bridge the curb weight necessary for an agricultural vehicle so that of course made it tax deductible for a lot of people that had their own businesses and could buy it do you see this vehicle as being something that you're going to see used in farms and that sort of thing or is it purely for the recreational customer well really there's there's um three people i think that uh, that are really attracted to it and and uh are buying them you can order them now from our dealers so we're kind of seeing the first flow of customers coming in and there's obviously the enthusiasts and the guys that want extra torque to, you know, wheel it up the extreme hills. They want to upfit them with 35s or 37s or 40-inch tires, so they just need more torque uh, to uh, to take their uh, gladiators off road. And then there's the people like you just talked about, uh, kind of like me wheeling it around the farm. I have a winch on it and it pulls out my uh, manure spreader when it gets stuck. I use it to put, you know, hay and grain in the back, and you work it as a as a truck. But it's just just the right size. Um, and then there's a third person, which is just looking for a little more um, fuel economy in a mid-sized truck. They've got the need for a mid-sized truck, you know, maybe you know, moving it around for their small business and that, that sort of thing. And then, but just really want really good fuel economy, and and uh, and the Gladiator pulls it off. So, you know, really kind of looking at uh, three kind of target groups that it. Uh, does a really good job of uh, satisfying. I just have this view, Jim, in my head that makes me smile incredibly. So obviously, you know, when you're an executive at a company like Jeep, you have vehicles that are assigned to you for a period of time in which you be- can become familiar with them and understand them and, and see them on a long-term basis and decide whether some of the early on decisions were made correctly. But I always have this imagination of when you turn your vehicle in to get the next one, the guys are, oh, Morrison bought the uh, Gladiator back from the farm, and it's covered in manure. <laughs> There's dents in it. <laughs> yes. I always yes. have that. It's the, we had to vacuum it for three days to get the dog hair out. I just have that <laughs> that whole imagination. <laughs> and you'll probably yeah. always say, please don't send me cloth seats. I need leather seats to make sure I can keep them clean. I just have that, yep. um, uh, that imagination going on. Uh, it, these vehicles can become pretty pricey if you start to add on a lot of the extras. Uh, uh, where were we looking at for the, uh, the Jeep Gladiator? Diesel, uh, just uh, over forty thousand. So it's um, you know it's a nice combination of uh, of capability and fun that nobody has uh, in that price and the payback. If you're working your uh, your diesel is pretty uh, is pretty easy for you. And then certainly when you apply the fun factor and the smiles per uh, hour, it really uh, it really does pay back quickly. I noticed uh, one of the things that uh, a lot of times people had to do, and this came out with the uh, the Wrangler diesel, is of course you have to have the ammonia spritzer um, in these vehicles. Does the the Gladiator have that? And then what's the? Do you know much about it? What's the refill rate on it? Because I know with the Wrangler, uh, it had broken some of the rules, and you had to refill it a lot less than you did the ammonia spritzers in some of the other vehicles that uh, have to have those in. Yeah, it does have the uh, the need for urea, and it's. Um uh, the, 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 right by the, the fuel nozzle, there's another little blue cap that you pop off and you can fill it up and, uh, and it's lined up, you know, broadly, you know, to, uh, line up with your oil changes. Uh, so sometimes, you know, depending on your duty cycle, you may never even touch it. The dealer can top it up for you when they do their oil changes. Uh, if you happen to work and tow a lot or, or, you know, drive a lot of hills or, or push the Jeep a little bit harder, you may have to fill it up, uh, you know, once or twice between cycles, but, 
you know, whether you grab the, the, uh, you know, a couple of gallons of it from our dealer and just kind of pour it in, uh, for, uh, for 15 bucks, it's, uh, it tops it up pretty, uh, pretty easily. Uh, you, you're going to have some news over the next few months at, at Jeep. Uh, when should we be paying attention? Now, uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's, uh, take a look at the Instagram feed today and, and that'll, uh, talk we're, we're coming on board here on, uh, on the 3rd of September. We're going to show the world the, uh, the eco or the eco-friendly, uh, four by E Wrangler. So it's the uh, first ever electrified, uh, uh, Jeep Wrangler. And, uh, we're really excited about that. And then, uh, uh, something that uh, I've been waiting to do for a long time is, uh, bring, uh, Grand Wagoneer back, uh, online as part of, uh, the portfolio here and and uh, it's really uh, a special uh, vehicle to uh, add back to the lineup it's uh, it's going to be a lot of fun to have the, the good feelings that everyone has in their hearts and souls with uh, Wagoneer and Grand Wagoneer um, and just to close the loop on that there uh, every Wagoneer that I know of is happier when it's got a dog in the back so yeah. it's, uh, <laughs> it's a great vehicle. Uh, one question for you and maybe you can't tell me but maybe you can wood paneling yay or nay say again wood paneling well, we've done some neat uses of wood, um, but it was really hard to repeat the kind of the the wood paneling of the '80s on the outside. So we've done some cool things with wood. I'll uh, I'll let you guys All stay right. for the uh, the reveal here on the third of September. Jim Morrison, uh, the big guy in charge of Jeep, with some really exciting news. Thanks, Jim. We're coming back. You're listening to our Auto Expert. Your smart speaker can be your radio. Just say, hey, Google, or hey, Alexa, or hey, Siri. Play Our Auto Expert. Oh, here we go. Here we go. And it didn't happen the last time I said this. Uh, play Our Auto Expert uh, radio show, and all previous episodes of our podcast are available. Hours of endless fun await you. I'm Nick Miles, and this is Our Auto Expert radio show, where 2 million Americans get their automotive news daily. Well, the next time that you head to a, uh, a dealership to have your Texas or, a, uh, sorry, Texas, to have your Toyota or Lexus, that's what you get when you combine Toyota yep. and Lexus. Texas. Texas. There you go. See, you didn't know that. Uh, <laughs> to get your Toyota or Lexus vehicle serviced at one of their brand's nearly 1,500 dealerships across the U.S., it is likely that a certified technician from Toyota Motor North, Motors North America, uh, the 10 program, will be servicing your vehicle. And we wanted to find out a little bit more about this program, so we've invited Joseph Myers. Uh, he is the manager at the T10 program. Uh, so, Joseph... In a nutshell, maybe explain to us what the T10 program is. Okay, well, T10 stands for Toyota Technical Education Network. We've been around since 1986, and what we do is we partner with community colleges across the country to train individuals to go into our Toyota Lexus dealerships as a certified Toyota Lexus technician. We and have been uh, turn- go ahead. I was saying, and, and this is this is how the the technicians arrive, or many of the technicians arrive at your dealerships. That is correct. We've graduated about twelve thousand uh, since nineteen eighty six. Uh, our Toyota dealers employ about twenty six thousand technicians. So, as you can see, we uh, supply a fraction of that number. Uh, we have another uh, segment of our technician population that would come in from other automotive programs or, you know, uh, come in off of the street, so to speak. I, I noticed that when I talk to my friends who uh, run dealerships or uh, they, they run mechanic shops, uh, they, their complaint uh, currently is they just can't get enough uh, qualified technicians to work at their dealerships uh, right now. So more than ever before, this is becoming an important way for you to bolster the numbers of those uh, available to service vehicles. Well, you're correct, and the Department of Labor predicts that across the transportation industry, there will be a shortfall of 370,000 technicians by the year 2026. And just inside Toyota, uh, we're looking at the uh, growing need. And if you just took a 10% need each year of the 26,000 that we currently employ, um, that would be 2,600 technicians that we need. That's in 1,500 dealers across the country. And those numbers actually align with what uh, we're seeing on a regular basis as far as what dealers are telling us they need. So 
So it's a, a great opportunity. Uh, it's an ever-changing industry. Uh, I started out back in the uh, mid-'80s as a technician myself, but uh, things have changed dramatically, as you well know. And so we're looking for individuals that are highly skilled and highly trained. I'm driving a RAV4 Prime right now, and it really signifies to me that the technology is evolving so fast in automotive that, uh, you know, if someone was a mechanic 20 years ago, the continuing education is probably more important than anything because as cars evolve, as trucks and SUVs evolve with the latest technology, those technicians have to evolve as well. Well, you're exactly right. Uh, You know, when I started out, you didn't need computer skills. Um, you needed some analytical skills, but not on the level that you need today. Uh, today, someone walking in off the street with just a toolbox in hand uh, doesn't have much of a future. So you do have to have quite a bit of training in order to be successful in this industry. And, you know, I look back across the years. Uh, I've been involved in the automotive industry well over 30 years, and I've seen so much change, and I look ahead, what, what is this going to look like in 30 years? And, you know, I saw us come out of the carburetor era into fuel injection and then into hybrids, what have you. But where are we headed with uh, autonomous vehicles? You know, will we be discussing or will the future generation be discussing, you know, I remember Grandpa talking about cars that wrecked. We don't have wrecks anymore because of the sophisticated techno- not technology. And we're going to have to have individuals that are highly skilled and highly trained to uh, to uh, diagnose and repair those vehicles. And, and a lot of it goes back to computer programming that, uh, that our technicians have to be able to do. So dynamics have changed tremendously over the last several years. I think when I look at uh, autonomous vehicles, and it's quite a, so- a sobering thought really, that uh, currently out of all of the accidents in the United States and the fatalities in the United States, uh, everybody, of course, understands that that is caused by pretty much 100% or close to 100% human error. It's humans that make those errors, and we're okay with that. I mean, humans make mistakes, uh, but when we talk about a vehicle that's fully autonomous, uh, we talk about computer error. Uh, and that doesn't happen, and that can't happen, and that's not acceptable. Uh, customers are not going to accept uh, human, you know, computers making errors with autonomous vehicles. And so the pressure is really on you, isn't it, to make sure that those vehicles function at 100 percent? It is. And, you know, something I refer to often, uh, we often think of uh, the technician as the Andy Griffith picture where Gomer Pyle is coming out and he's, he has a pair of pliers in his hands and he's, you know, bumbling around under the hood. That day is gone. Uh, right. We are looking at individuals who are at the top of the industry. Uh, we're competing with, with IT technology for individuals. So uh, it's, it, it's, it has changed tremendously. The other thing that I will say is the environment has changed. Uh, when I started out, uh, the little uh, dealership that I started in, you had to tell us it was heated. Otherwise, you wouldn't know. Now those dealers are not only heated, they're air-conditioned, very nice uh, situation for the technicians. So if there are uh, individuals that are wanting to get into this industry, uh, it's not just Toyota and Lexus. It's across the board. Excuse me, across the board. Uh, it's a great occupation to get into. Uh, if you love cars, this is, this is the way to go. If somebody wants to find out how they can be a part of the program and get more information, where would you direct them to? Uh, to our website, it's t-ten.com. All right. And uh, we have resources there. All right. T-ten.com if you want to find out about this uh, program and how somebody can get involved in it. Joseph Myers, the manager at t-10program.com or t-ten.com. Uh, you can find out everything there. Joseph, thanks for taking some of your weekend out to talk to us about the program. If you'd like to find out more about our show, of course, you can go to our website, which is our Auto Expert, O U R A U T O E X P E R T dot com. You can see previous episodes of the show. You can also, of course, sign up 
to be a podcast podcast member and listen to all previous episodes of the show there and of course have the opportunity to listen to uh, see all of our tv uh, episodes that are there some of our videos that uh, air on stations around the u.s and the world about the new cars trucks and suvs that we have been test driving and of course perry stern and his team mike meredith uh, and our boss write all the articles on the website they're testing cars so you don't have to you can kick the tires just by reading it watch the videos just by clicking it and listen to the uh, previous episodes of the podcast with nick and truck girl jen we will be back again next week but until then let the website keep you company i'm nick miles and this is our auto expert radio show you've been listening to our auto expert with nick miles find all the show episodes at our please follow us on all social media twitter Facebook, and Instagram at Our Auto Expert. And message us for a quick and witty response.